Well, brothers and sisters, we are continuing our series on the Gospel of Mark, and today we are on chapter 6. Now, we talked last week about how these chapters are a big chunk to chew, as it were, um, but uh, we are going to chew them anyways, as they are... It is helpful to, to get that big picture... But I, again, would encourage you to look at the Gospel of Mark at home with your family and sort of uh, if you have a, a good study Bible that you would look into some of the various details that are involved in each of these stories because often even a good study Bible or devotional can pull out things for us that we may not have been aware of and uh, things that we just we won't be able to get to fully in uh, a sermon that looks at a whole chapter at once. Chapter 6 um, is, we're looking at this chapter as, as, as an illumination of the great adventure that Jesus has for us, that God has for us. I don't know if you remember uh, 1992, some of you up there in the balcony may not remember 1992 because you weren't born, but uh, many of us remember 1992 and uh, uh, remember maybe uh, an album that a fellow named Stephen Curtis Chapman came out with, uh, The Great Adventure. Do you, anybody remember that album? Kent's nodding his head a little bit. Just, You're, the, just the name. Okay. Okay. Uh, I remember that album because we were uh, we were in university very shortly thereafter. We 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 heard the album through friends and stuff like this, and it it's neat that the album's called "The Great Adventure," as I mentioned, and, and it starts off with this cinematic score, and it and it builds into this song that talks about how this is the great adventure. If you get a chance to listen to the album, it's a little dated, but it still stands up all right. It went gold uh, at the time, uh, which is pretty good for a very Christian album. Uh, it did pretty well. Um, but it was a great album. And one of the things that Chapman wanted to communicate was that um, God does not call us to... God does not call us to a mediocre life. God does not call us to a mediocre life. And I'm not talking, uh, and neither was Chapman, God, we're not talking about successes or failures. We're not talking from the world's standpoint, that's for sure. And we're not, not, we're not talking about measuring a life by the world's standards, but we're talking about measuring a life by God's standards. Standards, And we'll pull that out and, and unpack that a little bit more. But regardless, it is true that God does not ultimately call us in his sense to a mundane or mediocre life. There's this saying that I sometimes use uh, jokingly that only the mediocre are always at their best. <laughs> Meaning that if you, if you never do well at anything, then you're always doing as good as you could, kind of. But of course, that's just not the way it is, right? God calls us to something higher and greater and more wonderful than that. So let's read uh, chapter 6 of the Gospel of Mark, and then we will go from there. Jesus left there, that is where we left off uh, in our last chapter. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his, hand on a few, his hands on a few sick people and heal them. 
He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this. For Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he, uh, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing to him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. <clears throat> she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. This is, of course, connecting back to when Jesus sent them out two by two. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, <clears throat> and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. <coughs> Excuse me. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He said, go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. 
Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when he, they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because all they, they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. For they had not understood about the loaves, their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the, clo the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The word of the Lord. Amen. That's a lot. That's a lot to take in. All right, I have a question for you. What did you want to be when you grew up when you were a kid? What was your, your dream job? And, and maybe some of you still have that. Any of you Osterhof children, you know what you want to be when you grow up? A hockey player like NHL? Yeah, that's what you want to be, eh? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, you want to be a hockey player too? Yeah. I thought uh, all you guys wanted to be farmers. Yeah, that too. Sure. I guess I guess if you're a, a hockey player, maybe you can afford it after you're uh, after you're retired to, you know, go farming and stuff. It's good. Anybody else? What did you want to be when you grew up? When you were a kid? Yeah, Randy. A car designer. A car designer. Hey, and you you're you're not totally off on that, right? Like you do lots of car drawings and animation and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah, Kent. A professional musician. And you're not far off from that either, right? You do some of that work and have some fun with that. Good. Anybody else? You wanted to be an archaeologist? Like Indiana Jones archaeologist? No, just a, just a regular old archaeologist. Nice. Nice. That's cool. I didn't know that. That's neat. Anybody else? A nurse. You wanted to be a nurse? I didn't know that. I've been married to you for 25 years or something. And I, wow. Learn something new every day. <laughs> I wanted to conquer the world. It's true. I did. <laughs> I wanted to conquer the world. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, so one of the things that we often dream about as children, right, is adventure. Even if we didn't necessarily have a career we are aiming for, there were maybe stories that captured our imagination, right? For me, it was comic books. I loved comic books, right? Especially Batman for me, right? And I could envision myself foolishly uh, being that superhero. Um, for, for my dad, it was some of the stories of H.G. Wells or, um, you know, some of those adventures, the, the Swiss family Robinson or, or things like that, that captured his imagination. What about you? What were some of those stories for you? Yeah. 
Hardy Boys Mysteries. Oh, my dad loved those too. Good stuff. Anybody else? Any other kind of stories? Yeah, Wendy. Nancy Drew, of course. Nancy Drew. One of my uh, favorite bands over the years has been Reliant K, and they do a whole song about Nancy Drew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Reliant K is good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Stories. Treasure Island. Something like that. Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Right? The Waltons. Yeah, the Waltons. Good. Wow, this is old school. This is great. Bringing me back. Anne of Green Gables. Ah, oh, yes. I think I had a little crush on Anne of Green Gables for a while when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. See, here's the thing is that there is some part of us that was meant for something greater, right? And that is not to say that all of us are called to become pirates or superheroes or, or pioneers exploring the world or, or amazing hockey players or, or whatever. That's, that's not what it's about. That's, that's sort of how the world thinks of it, but that's not how the Bible thinks of it. Certainly these guys who are hanging around with Jesus, they were not, at least at the start, they were not people who were extraordinary from the world's standpoint. In fact, we see that about Jesus himself in the very beginning of this chapter, right? Jesus is talking and, and preaching in his hometown, that's Nazareth, right? And he is, uh, the people around him are going, who is this guy? Where did this guy get this stuff? He's a carpenter. His brothers, we know, his sisters are right here with us. This is just some dude. Where does he get off? Doing miracles and being all wise and stuff. That's what, it, that's what they're saying, right? It's, it's weird, right? It, it's, like, it's like Superman who was just Clark, you know, reveals his identity and all of the people in Smallville go, where does he get off getting powers and being a superhero? It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It's not like, he could stop being who he was. But nonetheless, the people in Jesus' hometown, they take offense at him. Now, just a point of clarification. It says in the scriptures here in verse 5 of chapter 6, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. And we just need to clarify there because there is a, a, a strong misconception that somehow God's power through Jesus Christ relies on the people's faith. It's like almost like faith is like the charger that, that amps up the battery so that the miracles can be done. But that's not the way it is. Okay, God's power is not reliant upon our faith. But rather, what the scriptures is saying here is that, is that Jesus couldn't bring himself to do those miracles in that place because there is just so much cynicism and yuck and lack of faith. And he couldn't, he couldn't feel and do uh, those miracles in that place, not because he lacked the power, but because the atmosphere, the, the, the reality of the situation just wasn't right for him to do it, right? But Jesus takes these disciples, these, these 12 ordinary people, and, and in addition, he, he, he takes all the people who come around him, and, and he will, if he can, send them out on their adventures whatever they may be. What are the apostles, just by way of, you know, thinking, there's no points if you 
uh, you're not going to lose any marks if you don't get this right or anything. What are the apostles that you can think of that later on went on to do stuff that we know about that was amazing? Okay? The apostles who did stuff. Peter, yeah, Peter did uh, some pretty amazing things. He, uh, he eventually ended up in Rome, ended up being the first uh, pope, according to the Catholic Church. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. He evangelized all over the place. Anybody else? Philip? What did Philip do? Yes. Yeah, oh, sorry. I could, I, because your mask is on, which is good, I couldn't tell where you were. Yes, Philip uh, evangelized to the Ethiopian eunuch, and, and we believe that that interaction alone established uh, through that eunuch the Coptic church, which is really one of the oldest uh, still existing churches in the world, uh, denominations in the world. Uh, it's been there for like for always, practically. Yeah, cool. What else? Yeah, John. John. John did some pretty amazing things, right? He wrote several letters. He wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote the Gospel of John. Um, he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Uh, he was apparently boiled in oil and survived that. I don't know how that's possible, but apparently that's true. Um, yeah, amazing. Yeah. 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 Yes. This is something we often don't hear about, is that, uh, a, now we don't have a lot of his writings per se, but the, the Christian history and legend tells us that Thomas was the one who ended up bringing the gospel to India and other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, good. Yeah, Raven. Yeah. Yeah. She certainly testified a whole lot. Mary Magdalene did. Um, the, the women um, in the gospel story, they had a huge impact, right? Huge impact and faithfulness, right? There are a bunch of apostles, though, that we don't hear much about. Now, that's not because they didn't do anything, but we don't know that they all became like Peter or John or whatever. But that doesn't mean that their calling was somehow lesser. That their calling was not as good. Right? So here we're not talking about adventure as in you must become like Paul or like Peter or like John or something like that. No, instead, we're talking about the calling to follow Jesus. And that is adventure beyond adventure. And that calling, that calling can be fulfilled whether you are a mechanic or a pastor, or an animator, or a farmer, or a musician, or uh, a line worker at a factory, or whatever you do, you can be on the great adventure of following Jesus. Now it's interesting though, because the, the journey, the adventure has all of its ups and downs. We can see that just in this chapter alone, right? Jesus starts sending out the two by two, the disciples to go out and witness for him. And, and it's interesting because theologians think that the reason that Jesus sent them out two by two was that earlier in Deuteronomy, the biblical requirement is that two people serve as witness in any kind of sort of trial or legal proceeding, right? And so these two go out to this village or that village or another village, and they are not only spreading the good news and, and witnessing to the good news, but they are also testifying about those people, right? They are, they are 
probing and finding out about how willing those people are to hear the gospel. And, and when they are rejected, then they are to walk away and kick the dust off their feet and testify against them. But they get this journey and they get to teach and they get to cast out demons and they get to heal people. And, and then we go from this mountaintop experience and we get into the story of John the Baptist being beheaded, right? And then we realize that the adventure is not all about candy and roses. The adventure is about the, the grit and the dirt and the pain and the sorrow just as much as it is about the beauty and the glory and the healing. It is about all of those things. You see, we could, we could admire John who tells the truth to Herod. And the truth is, is that even Herod recognizes that truth, right? He may not like it. He may not agree with it. He doesn't like that John the Baptist is calling him out for marrying his sister-in-law, right? But he likes to listen to him in verse 20. And he protects John, at least until Herodias' daughter <laughs> does her dance. And then we realize, of course, that the adventure can even mean our death. And then we swing back to the glorious and amazing. It's Jesus feeding 5,000 men, not including the women and children, and teaching them many things. And lastly, we see the story of Jesus walking on water to them. See, I don't know that you or I are going to experience Jesus walking on water towards us. I don't know that we are going to experience Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus women and children in front of us. I don't know that you are going to be captured by an evil government official and beheaded by his dancing daughter-in-law's request. Right? I, I don't know any of those things. I don't know that you will preach the gospel here in Athens and people say, who are you? Who is Jim to tell me that stuff? Whatever. We know him. He's a farmer. Right? I don't know that. But in a way, from this chapter, it's not really the point. The point is the following of Jesus. And it's not just any following of Jesus. It is wholehearted devotion to and following of Jesus. And that's where the adventure comes in. Look, by way of contrast... Those plans that we had as children, those desires that we had as children uh, to be something when we grew up or whatever, right? Those are not only hungerings and longings for adventure, but they are also, in a way, us trying to control our own environment. How many of you actually became what you wanted to be when you were a kid? Wilma. I'm going to pick on you, Wilma. Wilma. That's okay, right? Um, so there's something about you that was made and designed to be a teacher. And we all know that. And that is awesome. And that is good, right? That is fantastic. But there is also a way, perhaps, I don't know, but there is also a way, perhaps, in which you saw something that you wanted to be a teacher and you designed your life in such a way that you could accomplish that goal. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
as long as it is all submitted to the will of the Father in heaven. Right? When I go my way without God, then I am not living the great adventure. When I go God's way, whether it's a plan that occurs over the course of 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, or whether it's a day by day, woo, riding by the seat of my pants on this one, whatever it is, when I am submitted to God, then I am living the great adventure. And that looks the same in a way whether you are planning to become a teacher or a mechanic or whatever. Or it looks the same when you are walking down the street and someone comes your way and God says to you in some subtle way, talk to that person. Say hello to that person. Open the door for that person. Ask that person how they are doing. Right? And everything in between. Even if it's eating Brussels sprouts. Right? So brothers and sisters, let us remember this lesson from Mark chapter 6. That God has called us on a great adventure. And the great adventure includes things that the world would think are spectacular and the world would think are mundane. And the great adventure includes things that are joyful mountaintop experiences and things that are sad and horrible from the world's perspective, like beheading. <laughs> but the most, the thing that it includes the most is loving wholehearted devotion to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you, O oh God, for the adventure that you gave your disciples, but also, O oh God, the adventure that you have given us. As earlier today, we, we, we confess that sometimes we take that adventure for granted. Sometimes we pretend as if it is not an adventure. Sometimes, truthfully, it does not feel like an adventure to us. But nonetheless, we know that good or bad from the world's perspective... That when we are devoted to following and loving you and loving our neighbor as ourselves, then the adventure is great indeed. Father, help us. Whether we are called to play in the NHL or whether we are called to teach a classroom or whether we are called to work on cars or play music or whether we are called to farm or work in a factory, whatever we are called to do, O oh God, help us to do it in full submission and glad submission to you that we may be on your adventure following Jesus where he leads. In his name we pray. Amen.